This event is organized by the Center of Study for Town Original Planning, FSPU UITM Pucha Alam Malaysia to celebrate the 100 years of town planning in Malaysia this year. We hope this webinar will be a platform for us, urban designers and urban planners from Kuala Lumpur and Jakarta to share our stories and idea to design a better city. So rasanya kita dah berjaya menghubungkan Kuala Lumpur dan Jakarta melalui projek bandar dan uh, Urban Design Association in uh, Jakarta, eh, Pak Anggar dan Dr. Suana. Uh, before we start, I would like to remind the participants yeah. to stay with us until the end of the webinar. You can drop your questions or comment or a story in the chat box and I will, I will read them later during the Q&A session. Uh, we will share the attendance link uh, 10 minutes uh, before the webinar ends for the e-certificate and training hour for UITM staff. I also like to remind participants to turn off uh, your mics during the presentation. Uh, I hope everyone clear, clear with the rules. Uh, and then to start, I would like to invite our Head of Centre of Town and Regional Planning, UITM Pucha Alam Malaysia, TPR Dr. Maliana Azati Marzuki, to give her opening remarks. Silakan, Dr. Maliana. Okay, thank you Misha Kila, uh, our moderator for today. Assalamualaikum and good morning everyone. Okay ke clear kan? Clear. Boleh dengar eh? Okay, uh, it is an honour indeed to have both amazing speakers with us, Dr. Suhana and Pak Angga. Eh? Uh, we appreciate uh, you making time in your busy schedule to speak to the students and the lecturers and all the participants who joined uh, with us today. Um, this urbanism talk is actually a series in conjunction with 100 years nation town planning that we have celebrated throughout uh, this year. Eh? Uh, well, uh, reading the cities, this is a subject in which we should really engage with and uh, should all be deeply interested because uh, we need to understand our cities and know how to read our city, yeah? read our city. And it is even more critical now uh, given the stress induced by the COVID-19. Um, I believe all the participants who joined this urbanism talk will enjoy and gain lots of knowledge about urban design in Malaysian city and Jakarta. Uh, thank you again, Dr. Suhana uh, and Pak, Gangga, Pak Angga. Uh, now, uh, I will pass back to Ms. Shakila, our moderator, to proceed with the next session. Over to you, Ms. Shakila. Ms. Shakila. Thank you, Dr. Maliana. Uh, so, we will start with our first speaker, Dr. Suhana Samsudin. Uh, I would like to read about the background of Dr. Suhana. Dr. Suhana Samsudin is a former professor in urban design at UTM and had, had served as an adjunct professor at the Faculty of Technology and Informatic Raza UTM. She is, she is also the president of the Malaysia Urban Design Association, or known as a Pareka Banda. She was a recipient of the Royal Town Planning Institute Prize for Academic Excellence at University of Nottingham and a winner of several research awards and international urban design competitions. She was an expert group member of UN Habitat to review the City Prosperity Index and was featured as one of the Malaysian Female Faces in Sustainable Places exhibition held at Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT, USA. She was the lead consultant of the Kuala Lumpur Heritage Trail Master Plan for DBKL and Territory Area Study for UNESCO World Heritage Site of Georgetown and Melaka for Jabatan Warisan Negara. She was also involved as the lead consultant for the project Urban Morphology for Melaka, nomination to the UNESCO World Heritage Sites for Prezim and author of the book, Townscape Revisited, Unrevealing the Character of the Historic Townscape in Malaysia, published by UTM Press. Uh, in that so, I welcome Dr. Suhana to deliver a presentation entitled Malaysian Townscape Unfolds. So I will share the slide and eh, Dr. Suhana, sekejap. Tiba-tiba hilang slide doctor. <laughs> okay, I, I'll start first before the okay. slide. Yeah? Just... Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, thank you to uh, UITM and the uh, Center for Town uh, Planning Studies. Uh, for organizing uh, this event, also inviting Preka Banda 
uh, to, to participate in, uh, in this event. Uh, as the NGO which champion good urban design practice in Malaysia, we are really happy uh, to um, support and uh, collaborate in any events uh, that helps to uh, champion good urban design in Malaysia and also increase uh, the awareness of the importance uh, for us to consider urban design as part of the process of the uh, city uh, planning and uh, city building uh, in Malaysia. So um, the topic that I would like to give today, which is about reading the city, I think that this is a general topic, but I take, I take this general topic as uh, a starting point uh, to talk about um, how people read the city and with, in reference to the uh, Malaysian uh, townscape. Um, okay, next. The way I think I've been given about 15 minutes, not not even an hour <laughs> to uh, to discuss about this uh, and what i'll be talking about is uh, first is how people read the city and uh, the theoretical uh, aspect of it being a former academician i cannot run away from discussing about theory <laughs> uh, whenever we talk about urban design and then i will look into the concept of the image of the city which is uh, uh, it, it, which is concept that is uh, uh, very uh, pop, uh, commonly discussed when you talk about city and also another important concept when you talk about how people read the city which is about the identity of place and then to look into the uh, concept of townscape and its significance in urban design and finally how townscape affects the way people read the city in doing so i'll be referring a, uh, a bit to the, the townscape that we have uh, 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 in uh, Malaysia. Now, um, when you talk about uh, how people read the city, we are actually looking into the relationship between the perception and cognition of the urban environment. Now, these are the two important costs that, that actually influence how people read the city. Uh, they are closely related. There's a symbiotic relationship between the two, but the, the difference is just in terms of the time interval, we, uh, which, I, which, uh, which is when we're talking about perception, we're talking about what is being seen and read through direct stimulation of the environment. That means uh, the, the, immediate relationship, uh, the, the immediate response as you observe the environment through using your visual faculties. And uh, the stimulants uh, that I meant here are objects in the physical environment like the buildings, streets, roads, and so forth. But when you talk about cognition, now cognition is another process uh, which actually involves perception. That means you are taking information uh, from the environment through your eyes and this information are being um, processed, sorted, coded, and stored in your brain. And whenever you are uh, you wanted to use this information, whenever you, you encounter this the place again, or whenever you're talking about the place, you will actually retrieve all this information. And this process of cognition is not a process of direct response as compared to perception. It's a process where your attitude towards the environment is influenced by many factors um, uh, such as your social background that means where you come from are you from the rural area or you're from the you're a, a, a city person or your cultural background uh, your um, religion plays an important role in the way you perceive and the way uh, the condition uh, uh, of the environment is being made your age how a child reads the city is different from the teenager from the the, the adults as well as from the elderly people and then your ethnicity, uh, your gender, male and female have a different way of uh, reading the environment and so with the ethnicity. And Malaysia being a, a country with many different uh, ethnic groups, so it is very important for us to consider the way the different ethnic groups uh, read the city, the way they, 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 they view the environment in the way we plan and design the city. So we cannot have a city uh, design uh, uh, when you say designing for all or paying for all, we have to consider that there, are, there is no standard way of doing things. There are many different um, uh, ways, uh, uh, many different types of people who are actually using the city as well as viewing the city. Now, um, 
why cognition and perception is important to the identity of place is because the environment is is the way people read it there is no such thing as the real environment because what how people read the environment will actually influence how they perceive the identity of place you can say that uh, is uh, when a designer says that okay i'm going to create this kind of identity but if the people do not read that identity in the way in the way they perceive the actual environment then you have failed in your theoretically you failed in, in your objective so it is very important for you to understand this process so that when you design the place you are actually designing according to how people actually read the city and uh, and your design objectives or intention will actually um uh, be um translated to the people to the viewers now in the process of people reading the city time and temporal aspects is very important that means the longer a place existed then it has a different way in the way people read the city as compared to new places that's why you will see that in historical places you know people tend to um enjoy uh going to these places and to build the environment because there is a special bonding uh, attachment between people and places that has existed for a long time uh, this is because of the process of cognition and when i talk about temporal aspect it's the time of the the day the way people read the city at night and the way people read the city in the daytime is different because of the lighting quality and because of the effect of the environment when the sun is not there and that's why uh it's important to when designing the city you have to to consider you know what will happen in the daytime what will happen in the nighttime what do people see in the daytime what do people see in the nighttime and most important of all when we talk about reading the city is that the city center is actually the face of the city when you talk about the face of the city, a person is recognized by the face, isn't it? The first thing that people do to recognize a place is the face. So the same goes with the city. And that's why this, the city center being the face of the city is also the center of meanings. And in the design of uh, or plan your city, a lot of focus must be given to how you plan and design the city center because this is the one that actually going to influence the way people read the city and the city center cannot be designed just like any parts of the city and that's why it's important to have a city center plan and a city center urban design master plan so that you can uh, actually uh, design the city center to give a certain identity that you want people to to read and also to uh, relate to next now going to uh, I, I noticed that many people have a misconception about um, image or when you talk about image. Different people have different uh, um, interpretation of what image is. When you talk to the politician, they will have a different idea of what uh, makes the image of city. When you talk uh, with the city branders, you know, those people involved in branding and advertising for the city will have a different interpretation of city. And you talk to the architects, the planners, uh, the various professions will have different way of interpreting what is meant by image of the city. But to the, to the urban designer, when we talk about image of the city, we are talking about how people read the city and the image that is shaped in their mind through the process of perception and cognition, which actually leads to this concept of imageability. Uh, what is meant by imageability is that quality uh, that enables a person to orient themselves in the environment. What I meant by orient themselves in the environment is how people find their way around. It's about wayfinding in the environment. And if the environment has a quality that makes it easy for people to find their way around, then the city has a strong image. So this relates to the perceptual structuring of the city. Uh, so the, the, the concept of imageability is very much related to this. Now, image of the city does not include identity of the place. So um, it is not correct to assume that once you have a strong image of the place, then you have a strong identity because they are looking at the city from different perspectives. Um, because we talk about identity of the place we are talking about meanings and associated with the place as well um whereas when you talk about image it's basically about how people read the city that affects their orientation within the city so 
clear image does not necessarily mean strong identity. Now, why I come to this, uh, I, I may have a different interpretation of this because the, my um, understanding of this concept is based on my PhD uh, thesis, which is about identity of place, where I critically reviewed the theory uh, image of city by Kevin Lynch and also to see how people in Malaysia visit the city and associate it with its identity. And this is the reason which prompted me to write the book, Townscape, um, can you see? Townscape Revisited. I wrote this book in 2011, uh, which was based on my uh, PhD. And this book is now being uh, used as a, a, a text, a textbook, and also a, re a, a reference uh, to teach urban design in Malaysia because it's discussing uh, the concept of townscape in the context of Malaysia. So um, although the concept of imageability consists of identity structure and meanings, Lynch theory of image of city actually was basically based on the urban structure. He actually he admitted uh, is the, the limitation of his uh, study. So he focuses more on urban structure. And therefore, it's, um, uh, we have to be careful when we plan and design uh, the, the, the city or urban places, not to just rely uh, solely on the theory of Lynch, but we have to also understand the, the theory about identity of place so that the two, when combined, will actually um, give that clear image and uh, uh, strong image and the clear identity. Now, uh, image is important because like I said just now, the environment is what the people think of it. And another thing is that image will influence the action and the behavior pattern through the process of perception and connection. And also, the image of the place and the way people perceive the identity will actually relate to people having an evaluation of the place. So when they like the place, they will use the place more. If they don't like the place, then that will affect their behavior pattern. So behavior to, uh, that's why in, in any urban design exercise, it's not enough just to study about how people perceive the environment. You also must look at the way the people behave in the environment so that you can see the missing link or actually what actually uh, uh, factors that create uh, the, the strong relationship between the two. Now, important functions of the clear image is, is more related to mobility functions because it becomes a frame of reference to the structural knowledge of the city. And a clear image will help people to recognize places in relation to their location. Next. Uh, next. To urban regeneration, uh, Arizona continue expanding the role in sharing experiences in several high-level education bodies in Indonesia and South Korea. As co-leader of the winning team of Indonesian New Capital Design Competition, Nagara Rimba Nusa, and continue to be involved in various project fees, Azuna is contributing in transforming Jakarta, urban Riam, by designing several public areas from pedestrian park to public park, and continuing empowering the research and education by developing Urban Plus Institute, the research group by Urban Plus, with a major focus on advancing urban design knowledge with Indonesian context and elevating the maturity of designers, at the same time, assuring the strong network between young designers in Asia broadly and Indonesia nationally. Arizona also ensuring the quality of Urban, urban Plus project to provide sophistications in Indonesia infrastructure and urban area. So, itu serba sedikit mengenai background Pak Arizona ataupun dikenali sebagai Pak Angga. So, Pak Angga, the floor is yours. You can start your presentation. Terima kasih Pak Angga. Thank you, Ms. Akila. Thank you, everyone. So, um, Dr. Suhana, uh, I will uh, start my presentation yeah, while um, the issue of the presentation, your presentation will be resolved. Uh, so, is my screen already shown? Ms. Akila, so you can see my screen. Yeah? And yes, yes. Can see my screen, yeah? yeah. Thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation. This is an honor for me to uh, uh, speak uh, here, to share my observation. And also, actually, I will talk more about the uh, my experience in reading the city by uh, using a sketch, yeah? um, uh, doing a sketch and, and experiencing the city and then trying to analyze. And also, as uh, Dr. Suhana just uh, mentioned right now, um, uh, I was trying, uh, uh, trying to um, uh, deepen the cognitive process as an urban designer. 
how to absorb all of the elements and all of the meaning, all of the character and image of the city. And then later on, when I am um, working on the projects or I try to implement whatever I have during my uh, observation, uh, I can use all of that as a vocabulary. So um, basically, I, I, um, I really, really enjoying the lecture by Dr. Suhana. I, I already learned a lot, even though it's only started for three pages. Dr. Suhana, but it's very interesting. So I, uh, I will share my perspective from the practice uh, or professional uh, point of view. Yeah. So there will be no not many um, academic terms, but it will be very easy language uh, uh, I'm using, and also it's more related to what we can see and what we can learn from what we see and what we uh, draw uh, through a sketch. Um, so uh, first of all, I just want to share a little bit about my uh, journey of experience. It's already mentioned briefly by uh, Ms. Sakila, but uh, actually, uh, currently I'm, I'm working uh, as a practitioner in urban design. I'm an urban designer, uh, but basically I'm a uh, architecture training background uh, student. So I was uh, um, studying as, uh, as an architects uh, I'm taking architecture school in Bandung and then I work uh, a couple years uh, in the architecture uh, uh, consultant before I learn more about the urban design in ITB in Bandung and then and join the uh, Center of Urban Design Studies in ITB so during the experience of urban design actually I learned uh, a lot about the design in the bigger and larger scale and I also was lucky because uh, I can um, also involved in uh, several projects throughout Asia. Uh, I was uh, working in Hong Kong under uh, ACOM. ACOM is, is a multinational company. It's it used to call as EDO. Uh, I think everyone, uh, I mean, uh, uh, most of people knows that actually this company used to be a design company, but then it became a ACOM. I was working with uh, uh, Hong Kong, with Hong Kong office. And I also actually involved in several projects uh, in Malaysia too. So it's very interesting when uh, during my uh, journey uh, of experience, actually uh, I be able to see a different uh, uh, background and different character of a city or of a location that I, I used to work on. Uh, I have experience also uh, looking at how the Middle East in the uh, early uh, 2000, like Dubai and Bahrain, uh, starting to to raise yeah, like like a star, and then have a very rapid development in there. But then it's uh, going to a very difficult situation of the economic uh, uh, issues. And I also been involved in a couple of the large uh, projects in China uh, uh, broadly. Uh, some of it also involved in Southeast Asia. And I think uh, one of the most uh, important experience that I've been uh, went through is being involved in the competition in uh, Malaysia by the DBKL when I was with ACOM. And I'm, I'm actually I'm the uh, I'm a member of the team that um, um, work on the River of Life uh, project. So it's one of the uh, most important uh, thing that uh, actually really affect my uh, thoughts and also my practice uh, you know, in the later future. In 2017, I um, established the uh, Urban Plus with my uh, senior partner, Sibelin Sofian. And this this is the just a very brief about the studio that now Sibrani and I and also with another two partners Vincent and Rahman working on. So basically, we have three division or three legs uh, within the studio. We have the projects, of course. This is the thing that uh, make the company running, and we also have the cities, which is this is the advisory. Uh, division for the cities. So sometimes we also advise a couple of the city leaders, such as governors or mayor of the city. We used to work very closely also with the uh, governor of West Java, Ridwan Kamil, when he used to be the mayor of Bandung. And we also advise a couple of another city leaders uh, in terms of urban design. 
Um, institute means the lacks of research and also publication and also this is the training uh, group of our uh, studio. So uh, most of the uh, studio member will go through uh, this institute to, to get uh, a lot of uh, training, a lot of uh, uh, educational uh, uh, train. And also this is the thing that we trying to uh, write or summarize uh, uh, whatever we have during the projects that we we going through. So this is just very quick, and then maybe just want to share that the the latest thing that maybe uh, most people knows about us is when we are when we were winning the competition of uh, new Indonesian capital in Kalimantan in Pasir Penajam. Uh, this is our entry on the competition, and we won the competition. And until now, uh, currently we are still working on the uh, master plan and urban design development of this new Indonesian capital in in uh, Pasir Penajam. Now we go back to the uh, topic. So basically today I want to share about uh, my habit of um, uh, sketching. Yeah, I mean, I'm trying to record everything I see to any interesting place, to any other place that I can learn from by uh, doing a very, very quick sketch. It's not a perfect sketch, but then I'm trying to uh, observe and also record whatever elements I see. So. Um, as an urban designer, uh, one of our um, way to to do a project is by uh, a storytelling. For us, it's very important because the the storytelling, as also uh, I I learned just now from Dr. Suhana, that actually uh, how how to read uh, the city and then uh, creating the imageability of the city is also part of the design process. So for us, for me, um, storytelling can be also tell, uh, told by a very simple sketch that we are creating over our visit to any other places. It also can uh, project the value or, or the narration of a city or of the places. And actually how actually it can help our profession uh, means in the design and urbanism profession. And also these uh, terms also uh, mentioned just now by Dr. Suhana. So the cognitive evolution actually help uh, sort of like um, can relate the habit of doing a recording by sketch and then uh, we uh, absorb it and then we try to think it deeply within our brain. And then later on, we can project it as one of our vocabulary or one of our uh, way to uh, to design or to propose a, a vision of a place or of a, a project or of a, a location or, of, or, or area that we want to uh, uh, work on. So let's try to explore actually how uh, my habit of uh, uh, sketching in reading the city actually can can help and also can inspire my way of work. Um, the the most uh, easiest way to observe actually to visualize the object wherever we we, we go wherever we, we see whatever we see and also whatever uh, the space that we, we experience um, I just try to you know to capture it and then try to uh, record it with a, a, a simple in, in a simple way to a sketches. So this is a couple of my observation uh, in a, a qua, uh, in a several interesting place that I, I thought is very, very interesting. So this is one of the place in Kyoto. Actually, they call it the uh, uh, Kimono Forest. So this is actually the very uh, touristy places, a destination in Kyoto uh, next to Arashiyama uh, Bamboo Forest. But then uh, I try to sort of like visualize whatever I see. Of course, I take uh, one or two elements and then combine it in a, a one simple sketch and actually can show, if you can see here, not only the buildings and not only the urban elements, but also the activity that people actually doing in the places. So this type of um, way to uh, create a sketch and to create a recordings of a place uh, together with the activity actually it's a very very efficient way for us to be able to remember 
Jadi what whatever we see in the in that places and what what's the uniqueness of the uh, of the area, uh, as you can see here. Actually, this sketch um, took me about almost four hours to finish because I'm not that uh, 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 fast in sort of like do uh, the coloring by watercolor, but then uh, by doing that, actually we can really absorb and we can really remember uh, uh, very well with whatever we see there. And then we are, we also, when we, we do a drawing, usually we try to, we, we, we think and try to remember whatever we see in there. And sometimes uh, a collection of a photo that we shoot in the, in the place, it will help us to remember and help us to uh, recording these things. Um, sometimes also we just try to capture the natural elements of the city. This is uh, the uh, a spot, one spot in also in Kyoto. They call it the Philosopher's Path. Uh, so this um, place actually become famous because it used to be uh, a small. I mean, it, it's a small river, and it used to be a, a a corridor for a lot of thinkers and philosophers in in Kyoto to sort of like become a place for them to think. So when we were trying, when I was trying to capture this, actually it's not an easy uh, thing for me because um, as an architect, I'm get used to draw a buildings, right? So do or draw a landscape actually is quite a challenge for uh, people like me. But then when we are trying to, to capture the landscape, we can also try to relate how the landscape as part of the townscape, yeah, just like Dr. Johanna mentioned before, actually it's also help us to know and also to dig out and experience about the space, you know, about the scale and also about how the nature actually become a very important element in the uh, urban area. And even when we see and we, we come to a very, very vibrant urban area like this place in uh, Sinchon, this is a very close to uh, Yonsei University. Uh, I, I was very lucky to be uh, invited to give a uh, lecture in there uh, uh, about the uh, development in Southeast Asia. I also used that opportunity to try to capture what I see in there. This is very important thing because uh, this situation is actually uh, cannot be fine in uh, any other places because. Um, as you can see, the situation here, I mean, it's very vibrant with people, or people walking, most of them are students. And actually this uh, uh, road, uh, as you can see, there is a bus in there, but actually this road is only allowed for a bus to uh, uh, passing through. So it doesn't allow the private vehicle or small vehicle, just like we've seen in Kuala Lumpur or in, in Selangor or in Jakarta. Uh, to you know to pass by this street so this street and this area become a very vibrant area a very very active area full of the activity not only the uh, educational or academic activity but also a uh, commercial and retail activity that supporting the livelihood of the students so when we try to you know to uh, grab the ambience and we also sometimes trying to uh, capture the uh, what we know in the Kevin Lynch um, theory is the notes or landmarks of one location. It will also help us to think about the structure of the places. Like we've seen in here, this is the capture uh, in, this is in Seoul, yeah, in South Korea. This is one of the uh, 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 recently famous uh, uh, place in, in uh, uh, Seoul. At, uh, it's called Iksondong, actually, this is the area where they have a series of uh, hanbok, uh, the uh, architect traditional architecture of a Korean house. So they turn it into a newly uh, revitalized commercial and F&B area. And we can see here, actually, the mixture between the old architecture with the new development and the new active programs actually create uh, a very unique ambience, uh, and and also uh, we can see how the play, uh, the, the the playful materials and the language of architecture also been mixed in here. So this um, type of uh, sketch, and usually um, uh, for us, yeah, uh, architects or student of architecture, you always do 
uh, uh, capturing a very nice architecture objects, uh, capturing the uh, uh, design and also the shape and the form of, uh, this is one of the uh, quite famous uh, buildings by uh, Kengo Kuma uh, in Tokyo. Um, this is the Starbucks Reserve Roastery and they, they uh, I mean, they uh, marketed as one of the biggest Starbucks Roastery Reserve in Asia, which is the design is very cool, it's quite cool. Uh, we can see how uh, Kengo Kuma tried to capture a very traditional elements of Japanese architecture and then mixed it and blend it with the new type of materials and also language. And I think um, when we try to capture the uh, situation of one uh, location, it's not only talk about the buildings, but also it's, I mean, I was trying to capture also the activity and also uh, what kind of uh, space and what scale of space actually is working in that uh, particular area. And sometimes this is also uh, helping us not only to uh, memorize it as a place, but also we are starting to uh, capture the language of architecture, the style of the uh, materials, and also how the people use uh, how people use that as an activity place. So even sometimes uh, I, I took a quite um, a further approach to make a record or journal. Yeah? So this is. Uh, one of the travel journal I usually trying to do whenever I, I go to or travel to a very interesting places, not only to capture the moments, but also try to give a description and maybe a little bit of the analysis of the places. So when I, uh, the first time I was in the Indian Zaka and Sanan Zaka area in Kyoto next to Gion uh, market area, I think the scale of the place is very, very uh, capturing my eyes. And as an urban designer, uh, we can we can see that actually the the uh, medieval structure of the old city in Japan actually have a very, very nice uh, scale and very nice approach how they create the uh, living spaces can work with the uh, religious uh, uh, spaces, activity spaces such as a a temple in here uh, and to and and if it's re, re revitalized as a new places it can be uh, um, I mean it can be a very very interesting place and a destination for everyone so uh, that's where I try to I'm starting to analyze whatever I see and whatever I draw and try to capturing the essence and also the character and actually what is the lesson learned we can we can get from there so this place in South Korea, it is very uh, a quite famous place there because it takes a quite a, a big scale of redevelopment in, in Seoul. This is the Gyeonggilan Forest Park. So the development actually is uh, changed the old um, alignment of railways, the old railways. They change it into a very long corridor, open spaces for pedestrians. Uh, for people to walk uh, from one district to another district. And this create a very nice structure where uh, we see it used to be a very heavy infrastructure of the city and then become a very soft and a very uh, spacious place for people to, uh, to do uh, things. And I think this kind of things uh, started uh, to become a, uh, uh, I mean, uh, I, I started to, to sort of like think about the analysis of these places and how and think about how this uh, used to be an infrastructure places now become a third place or a sort of like the activity place for people in the city and also we can start to see how it's structured in the city uh, in the right hand uh, side uh, i try to map it in the map in the sort of like a maps uh, actually how long this corridor goes from one point to another point I think it reads around 5.9 kilometers something and it's it goes through a lot of interesting places and it's also become the uh, one of the integrator or connector within the city. So um, this is where the analysis is starting to, you know, to pop up in our head and I was trying to capture it and to record it as a form of a sketch and also a diagrams. 
So all of these actually the things that usually we do in our uh, work offline when we do a project in urban design scale, usually we always uh, use a maps and uh, as a baseline to do a, a diagrams or simulation or also a frameworks of a design of a master plan. And here I try to use the same language, how to actually to sort of like appreciate and also analyze and also uh, observe a very important elements that we've seen on the site. So from this kind of a very, very uh, simple sketch, actually we can learn a lot about the imagibility of the places. Like usually we, lo we love to do a, a sectional uh, diagram or drawings that showing how the relation between the buildings and also the activity in front of the buildings. So this kind of uh, recordings and this kind of methods to to reading to read the city actually is quite fun because we can uh, do uh, whatever we want. You know, sometimes we, I mean, we are not artists, yeah, and we we don't sell this uh, drawing as the product of an artist, but we do drawings because it's one of the methods for us to capturing and reading the city. So we can do what uh, whatever our interpretation would be in the drawings. Uh, to be honest, I never really draw a place that really looks very similar and as a copy of the place or a photo. But instead, we are trying to absorb uh, the elements and we, we try to put uh, whatever we want to show there, uh, a nice things, a very uh, a nice elements and also a very vibrant activity uh, we've seen in there. So these things usually after we capturing it, it's, it gets started to become a vocabulary for all, for me because uh, the situation where a uh, a very nice intimate alley, a very intimate scale of alley become one of the most uh, a famous uh, commercial retail area and also a very vibrant place for people to have activity actually have a very unique situation where the um, elevated or uh, sort of like a terrace uh, type of the elevation, it gives a very specific uh, a different situation uh, compared to other places. So this, all of this analysis, usually uh, I, I uh, put it as a drawing as part of the journal, but also later on, when I go back to the office, back to my desk, it become another series of a vocabulary of urban design elements that I can use uh, in the any of the projects. The the um, reading of how one of the street goes. This is in Nakamiguro in Tokyo, one of my uh, favorite uh, uh, streets uh, or neighborhoods because it's just next to the uh, uh, train station here uh, on the right side uh, in this photo. But then next to it is already become an array of commercial and retail and also. Uh, it's gearing towards a residential neighborhood area. So how actually this station working with the neighborhood and become a TOD without being disruptive into the, the neighborhood is also another lesson learned to uh, get because uh, we um, all of these small uh, shops in here become a very, very unique uh, shops uh, that actually not, uh, I mean, um, cannot be found in anywhere. This is a very specific especially in uh, all over Tokyo or a city like Hong Kong or Seoul, usually the situation like this, the mixture between the old traditional structure of the city and then blend with the new and um, contemporary programs, it sort of like become a new character and a new identity of the places. So um, this type of um, journaling, uh, I, I keep doing this just because uh, I need to, I want to learn about the places. Uh, sometimes um, it helps us to think about uh, more about the analysis because it has a lot of uh, various vibrant colors. You can you can uh, put any any of your favorite colors on it, and then you can also give interpretation of the diagram you wanna uh, uh, capturing in there, and and all of that actually um, indirectly become. Um, a lesson learned or a series of vocabulary that you can always pull out as part of the inspiration later on. Like all of this early in uh, most of the Japanese uh, street in Tokyo actually become one of the inspiration how to create 
a very nice urban uh, fabric um, in the urban area in the center of the city that have a certain type of uh, character or image and uh, also at uh, different places usually we we can find a, a different a fun and a different vibrant uh, situation. So this is uh, sort of like a couple of the points that I usually uh, try to uh, take as a lesson learned. So of course, we can find uh, the fun and joy of experiencing it. And also we can reactivate our inner spirit because uh, whatever we see in there, of course, it will be more interesting if you can show it to other people or show it to your friends. unique interpretation not only by using a photo but also you can use your interpretation to tell a story about the places and it's also uh, indirectly it also um, make us forcing us to exercise how to sort of like convey a message of a place and also how to uh, visualize the image of the character of the place to to other people Sometimes this type of uh, sketch also works well with the clients. I mean, the, the people who hire us as urban designer, because the unique way of uh, the sketch, sometimes it cannot be uh, changed or it cannot be uh, replaced by other uh, a very nice digital rendering. So this is one of the thing, actually, um, uh, uh, the methods, uh, not only to visualize, but also to capturing and also to sort of like storing all of the elements and all of the structure that we see in a different place in the different city. So um, to read the city as a part of our experience, I think this is very, very important for us uh, designer or for us architect, for us urban designer, uh, to be able to have an array and very wide range of uh, vocabulary because Later on, all of this will become the inspiration and aspiring ideas for our uh, works, uh, line of works. So this is the thing, uh, I think uh, this is the points, all of these the points that we can always learn from how we capture, how we read the city through our eyes, and then we try to visualize it through a sketch or drawing or very simple diagrams. And then all of that can be bring down to uh, whatever fields or uh, location or places that you you want to uh, design because then all of that reading actually i try to bring it to my practice in jakarta uh, and also uh, when we see a city actually um, uh, one of the things that we have to uh, read as part of the elements is the activity of the people uh, or also the uh, the you know the trend activity that actually currently is um, become hype in the in the city. Like if you can see here, this is kept. Uh, this is my shot in the uh, very beginning of the pandemic, like almost two years ago. And as you uh, can also now see, actually, uh, a, a ride a bicycle, a bicycle has become one of the new trends for the people in Jakarta and Indonesia generally. So when we see the you know the new uh, habit like this seems like yeah um so uh, when 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 we see this kind of activity we we want to also capture actually what type of places that can accommodate uh, this type of new activity so all of this actually i capturing it over my pelajar seorang waris jadi tak ada siapa nak uh excuse me uh so okay i i uh, continue yeah so all of this uh, very quick sketch actually i did during my uh, bicycle riding throughout the, the throughout jakarta throughout the city and and to be honest since i uh explore the city by riding a bike and apparently i can find and i i can explore more of the city corner that i never been visited before so this is some of the things that actually become a, a memory or a vocabulary that actually jakarta also have a, a very traditional uh a chinese temple that i uh you know i found in one of the corner of the north north of jakarta and then also a, a couple of the spots that i never really see before and i think 
uh, uh, put it down in sort of like a journal and also capturing it as part of our uh, experience, it also can become one of the vocabulary how actually we want to perceive the city, uh, including uh, our uh, bike riding to uh, the northest part of Jakarta next to the kampung in here. This is one of the informal kampung in Muara Baru and next to the Actually, this is the uh, part of the water of the sea, and uh, um, it might not be shown in here, but actually this part have a seawall that actually already, uh, I mean, the height of the seawall is higher than the uh, kampung that actually located just behind it. So this type of elements, when we can capturing it, I think is one of the of, uh, best uh, way how uh, we, we record and we sort of like capture the immediate of the city, including the new type of infrastructure in the middle of the city uh, that actually become part of the contemporary development in Jakarta. So the uh, uh, a broad sidewalk, a very wide sidewalk, and also contemporary architectural uh, bridge like we see in here actually is part of how the city tried to capture the, uh, the modern essence of it. And all of that, of course, uh, I was trying to capturing it and then become a vocabulary to be able to turn it into inspiration and ideas when we when we do a, uh, a project or works within the city. So this is one of the way how we try to summarize and uh, encapsulate all of the readings through, I mean, readings of all of that interesting places. I try to put it as a very, very simple diagrams to show the principles of one of the pedestrian path network that we did in Jakarta. Uh, believe it or not, before 2015, there was no uh, urban designer that actually involved in the creation or development of the pedestrian network in Jakarta. So all of the pedestrian path actually, I mean, we. Uh, just uh, become a part of the site uh, walk or just become one of the elements of the road without really be designed and really been connected uh, to other places. So these principles actually we create and we help Jakarta City since 2015 to create how we, we connect the city and how we celebrate the city through the celebration of the landmarks, uh, through the celebration of the uh, um, important uh, places in Jakarta and how to create a way finding that actually be able to uh, for people to sort of like find an interesting place in, in Jakarta itself. So we also try to make uh, a way uh, to prior prioritize the pedestrian, the human movement uh, on top of the vehicle movement in Jakarta. One of the way is we, uh, we manage to be able to succeed create this kind of uh, crossing uh, of the road, but we do it with the same level as the pedestrian path on the uh, roadside. So when people just walking in and crossing, they don't find any difficulties to go across, uh, including all of the different people with uh, different abilities to cross with the uh, wheelchair or anything. So uh, people can be able to go across easily. and. On the other side, we are trying to reduce the speed of the vehicle by creating the speed bump and and with a different type of materials applied in here. So the uh, cars have to be sort of like reduce the speed whenever they go across this kind of uh, junction. So that's one of the things where all of the inspiration help us to shape also the experience in the broader uh, network in the city. This is also a couple of our works, uh, design works within the city that creating and combine how the the, the uh, small garden park or small garden become the elements of the pedestrian path. And it's also become a enjoyable space for the people to walk. This is actually one of the uh, importance and, and one of the challenges that actually Jakarta faced since uh, a while ago. So, um, Creating this, uh, it used to be just a very technical sidewalk without any interesting places, without any attraction, without any opportunity to make a use of the places. But now, after we uh, design it properly and try to connect it with the surface of each of the buildings, 
along the street. Now we can see this kind of activity in several uh, sections of the road in Jakarta. For us as urban designer, this is one of the dreams that actually we always see in the uh, more modern city uh, in other places like in Tokyo, in Seoul, or maybe, maybe even in Europe. So this kind of thing actually is always started by seeing and inspired by other uh, places, other uh, better uh, uh, location. And then we try to bring in, uh, bring it home and then we try to apply it, of course, with a very uh, intense collaboration with the city uh, government, with the uh, provincial government of, of Jakarta. And it's not, it's not easy. I mean, uh, it's not a, a smooth process, not always. Sometimes we face a lot of challenges, especially about the coordination between the public sector with the private sector in Jakarta. But then all of this actually started with my habit of uh, reading the city by sketches. And this is just to show how Jakarta tried to evolve uh, in the latest uh, uh, in the, in the uh, latest development. Uh, in the city center. This is one of our proposal in Duku Atas. This is actually the center of uh, transportation in Jakarta, whereas Duku Atas have the MRT station. Uh, we also have the train station. We also have the uh, airport uh, train station goes to the airport. And we also the same points. And we are trying to have this proposal to connect all of the station from one station to other station and then connect to all of the places in the city center uh, and make the uh, movement or the mobility of the people to, 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 to be smoother. So this type of challenge actually is a challenge about how to build or how to develop a city with the uh, coordination between the private sector and also the public sector. So this bridge, we call it the uh, multi-layer uh, pedestrian bridge actually is not only have a, a public spaces. This bridge actually is funded and, and constructed by the pro private investors, not by the government. And I think the creation of the kind of places and also I see a very nicely done also in Kuala Lumpur, yeah? uh, uh, Dr. Suhana also uh, uh, just now sharing about one photo in the in, in, in the Masjid Jamek. I think it's one of the uh, examples or one of the inspiration that we want to have a similar type of open spaces, public spaces with a very nice corridor and that can that a people of the city can enjoy and uh, you know uh, do the activity in there and also can read and remember. This, all of this is one, uh, I mean, this is one of the effort, how the synergy and and it's how actually all of the habit and how to with the city is related to the development. If I can say, if I, if I may say that actually from my experience, from the vision and ideas and, and, and it's actually uh, can came or source from a very broad and very wide uh, ideas from other places. And then if we can imagine the city, it will be an inclusive city that have a good urban design in the future. The transformation and growth should be done by the public sector to 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 set up a base or the a baseline infrastructure and baseline requirement of the development. But then we also need the private sector to be jump in to be chipped in into the process. So the this is um, the diagram that's showing actually how the challenge are uh, of a. Uh, uh, big city in the developing countries, uh, especially in Southeast Asia. Uh, actually faces uh, every day. So this type of thing actually is become the inspiration and how we we sort of like try to uh, maximize and optimize whatever we see, whatever we capture, and that all of the elements and the uh, 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 elements and also the situation that we dream for our city in the future. 
So I think uh, um, this is the big question that we always have to pursue and push for the future, how to strengthen the public-private integration. But then, as I think after this, we can also uh, hearing from Dr. Suhana actually how all of these things is also have a elements or requirements that we have to realize uh, by experience it every day, you know, in, in the daily life, whether uh, we experience it, we look look at it in other city or in any other, uh, any other better places or even in our own city. So I think that's the uh, sharing uh, uh, by me today. Uh, I hope it's not uh, too long, but then uh, I just try to share how the uh, process to read the city and then put it in the methods of the sketching and also put it as a uh, urban design or the travel journal. It also can help for us to imagine and reimagine and design the future of our city. Thank you very much. So I give the floor back to uh, Ms. Shakila. Thank you, Pa Angka, for the very interesting um, uh, presentations. But let me read several comments in the chat box from Rahmat Bayudi, amazing work, Sir Azuna Sinaga. And then from AR Mustafa Kamal, it is very good sketching exercise and also analysis done through sketching. It also shows that when we architects or planner and urban designer must get away from the visiting the more touristic spots of the any cities in the world, but to see and go to the curated spaces by the architects, planner and urban designers of the city we are visiting. This will help us to be focused and be analytical of the qualities of spaces made as well as to be in the contact with the contextualisms of designs in the cities. Yes, correct. But I, re I really like the big questions uh, at the end of your uh, at the end of your slides about how we can straighten the uh, networking about the public and private. But we, I think we, we we can we can think about it together. All right. Uh, overall, uh, but if you want to see more works, uh, sketching uh, by uh, Panga, you can follow him uh, on Instagram. Uh, Arzuna Sinaga and you can uh, you can see uh, all the sketching works by Paanga. It's very 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 uh, amazing. Okay, thank you Paanga and then we back to Dr. Suana. We hope that the slide <laughs> already fixed the, the slide. Let's see. Um, try to share again. Ini nak habiskan doktor? Okay dah. Uh, next. Kenapa dia kecil ya? Eh? Sebab saya save dalam PDF. Ting. Tak boleh. Saya nampak lah tak boleh baca. Kecil sangat ke besar? Kecil. Tak boleh baca. Tak tahu what the rest can see but I cannot read. Kecil. Hmm. Ah, kalau macam ni kecil sangat Yang tadi besar Ya yeah? Ni kecil okay, lah tak doktor. nampak Tak nampak langsung Kecil ah, ah. Cannot read This one lagi kecil uh... Ni tak boleh baca Kecil Macam mula-mula tadi. Hmm, sebab dia dah save dalam PDF. So dia punya setup dia dah lain sikit. So dia... Doktor tak nampak macam mana? I don't know. Where can the rest see? Nampak? Uh, Doktor Hakim Ozak kan saya nampak. Boleh nampak sekarang? Uh, writing. 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 Yes, yes. Boleh nampak clearly. Ah. <laughs> Doktor tak boleh nampak. Ah, Doktor Suara kena zoom out dekat screen. Oh, saya ada masalah ni. 
Tak apa saya tengok dari screen saya. Okay. Uh, can we go? I think this one kan. I think we stop just. Slide number five. We stop just now at um. How people read ah? Uh, okay, kita okay. Slides number um, five. Number number five, okay. Tahun sikit. Uh, dia dah habis dah dia punya continuation tu ni. Aduh, I'm so sorry. Dia tengah aku momentum. Ada dah tahu. This, I'm so sorry to the audience. This is the first time I've been involved in a webinar and things doesn't work <laughs> as expected. I don't know what's the problem. But never mind. Um, can, I just hope you can bear with me. We'll just continue from uh, where we stopped just now about image of the city. And... Uh, when I was discussing just now how the perception and cognition influence how the townscape is being read and uh, one of the most uh, uh, popular theory that has been used to describe the image of city is that by the by Lynch but like I said just now we have to remember that the Lynch theory is not necessarily relating to identity it's more about the image as a result of the structuring uh, uh, and the perceptual structuring of the city by the observer. So Lynch um, identified there are five elements um, that influence the imageability of the city. That means how uh, people read the city in terms of its structure, of which paths, you know, the channel of movement is the most uh, important uh, element that people use to, to read uh, the city and use it in, uh, in their wayfinding process. And then there are the district, which is uh, areas of thematic character uh, that actually helps to organize the city in terms of the way uh, in the process of uh, recognizing places and uh, and the way uh, to nav navigate uh, in the city. And then landmarks, uh, visual elements used as uh, a reference point external to the observer. Now, uh, in Lynch theory, landmarks relates to vertical elements that can be seen by far. But there are also another element that helps the process of recognition uh, 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 where we call it a place marker. Uh, place marker is uh, an element that is not necessarily vertical, that not necessarily can be seen from far, but it's being used by the people in the way they read the city to mark a place for them to remember. So place marker can be just a door, a red door, or just a, a tree or a, a potted plant, you know, a, a place in front of the building. But people use it uh, as a way to recognize that place. So, uh, in a way, uh, the uh, relationship between uh, place marker and la landmark is just uh, as a matter of scale. Landmarks is used for uh, reading the city at a, at a bigger scale, and place markers are being used to read the city, to recognize places at the lower scale, probably at the street, street, street level. Uh, scale and then there is the edges you know this is a, a linear element that divide two faces a city can easily be um, uh, structured uh, probably when the edges are very clear and uh, when the edges are very strong uh, that helps them to identify the differences between uh, uh, one part of city uh, and the net uh, and the rest but when the edges are very blurred I mean when the edges are not uh, uh, properly uh, being uh, designed to 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 signify the difference between two faces, this is when the confusion uh, starts and uh, the concept of no man's land, uh, places where nobody is taking care of it, is actually as a result of very blurry and fudgy edge. And then finally, there is the node. Now, these are strategic points of concentration. These are points in the city that, uh, that draw movement and the intersection of uh, paths, uh, major paths uh, are normally uh, the nodes because this uh, at this uh, at this point you know you can see the movement of are, uh, are, are being um, integrated uh, and then um, uh, this place okay uh, next you, after discussing the uh, I think I it's a shame that I have to give this story before Pak Angga's uh, uh, slide uh, talk because Panga slide actually uh, actually is the the one that illustrate you know what all these concepts that I've been discussing. So it would have been better if uh, but then because of the technical glitches, so I have to tell the this uh, discuss this theory after Panga has shown these magnificent sketches and the way he uh, uh, reads and interprets the city. So never mind. I think. Um, 
probably is uh, is already um, fated that it, this will happen this way. Uh, the next concept is the identity of place, uh, which is also very important um, concept that is actually one of the ultimate goal of urban design is to secure the sense of place and also to make sure every city has its identity and distinctive so that we can um, recognize places uh, based on its own uniqueness and, and character. And uh, it is a failure in the design of city when, you, when all city looks the same. And uh, if you even if you have a very um, efficient, uh, a very good uh, town planning, doesn't necessarily means you can have a, a place, a city with identity if you do not focus on the design uh, of the city. This is what we have. We at Preka Banda has been uh, championing all this while and been trying to create the awareness that good urban design must come uh, hand in hand with good planning. Now, when we talk about identity, we are actually talking about quality that makes a place distinctive setting it apart from other places, which is different uh, to the concept of imageability that I have discussed earlier. And uh, it's also about, uh, when you talk about identity, uh, uh, we are also looking into the concept of place. Uh, a city is a place. And what is a place is, it is about a geographical location with identifier, uh, identifiable physical attributes, which is supported by social connotation. Uh, an example is a space. A space becomes a place when there are meanings attached to that space. So otherwise, without meanings attached to the space, then the space will just be a void in the city. So this concept of place uh, is very important. And uh, I've seen uh, recently you know, in Malaysia, we are, we are now getting into the uh, the trend of creating a place making. Uh, but um, it has to be uh, remembered that you, know, you have to design places uh, with meanings attached, not just to do a beautification uh, to create a place. Now, the other important uh, thing to remember when we discuss about identity is that uh, it is a concept where we look into the physical attributes having the sameness of character that influence how people read the city and associate it with the way they identify the city. What is meant by sameness uh, in character is not to make all the buildings in the cities looking the same. It's talking about the character, the, the general ambience, uh, ambience of the, the the environment having a character that actually um, is being um, uh, designed to have a sense of a unity in the way that it is an ensemble of uh, uh, elements that make up the city having a character that can be read as one so, so um, without the um, without uh, effort being given to actually design for what makes the identity, what makes the sameness of character, you know, you will, we will have a state of chaos in the city where everybody, uh, every buildings will be designed according to the uh, individual uh, architects and uh, designers of and fences or even the developers uh, vision of what uh, the place should look like. Uh, a good example when we talk about identity is if you look at uh, cities in the Mediterranean, sorry I don't have this, but you look most cities in the Mediterranean, they will have uh, their identity is created by the color white. So all buildings, regardless of the, the design, the shape, the form uh, and the height, they will have only whitewash paint. And you can actually have a sense of, uh, you can easily uh, capture the sameness of character through that color. Or if uh, another example in uh, uh, Florence, uh, Italy, where the building material uh, that is being used to construct of the uh, the, the city uh, of uh, Firenze or uh, Florence, uh, having the same uh, uh, unique color, something like a terracotta color, where where and the dome you know, of the dome, or you know, a huge dome that becomes the one that unify the design and giving the identity for the city. So there are lots of ways of give, giving, getting the sameness of character, but you have to decide, you know, what are the attributes that you want to use to unify the design to create, the, give the identity for the city. Now, remember, time is an important component in the way people read the identity of city. That's why all heritage uh, places, historical, historical places have a stronger identity compared to the new one because people have to learn to read and to digest and uh, and to assimilate uh, what they see in the newer city in order for them to identify the city. But for the historical places, they've been there for a long time, for generations, and uh, it's easy for them to establish their identity. 
and this is the very reason why we need to conserve and protect uh, uh, heritage uh, places because of this issue of identity. Had we destroyed all the historical places, then we'll be uh, in dire straits, you know, to create a new identity, um, to create uh, an uh, identity for the uh, city. Now, identity also refers to objects in relationship. So when we talk about identity, it's not about just one. There's no such thing of uh, having um, building, you know, being designed. Sorry. Uh, there's no such thing as uh, having an architecture, uh, uh, just focusing on architecture of the buildings to create identity if you do not see the, the, the building, uh, the architecture in relation to uh, the, its context. So um, the presence of distinct elements where the characteristics are recognized and remembered by the people are the one that is actually uh, uh, important to give the identity. And identity place makes a place more memorable and uh, highly uh, identifiable and that's why it's so important I mean we at Parakabanda is, is trying to really push for this agenda of making cities with identity because we want city to be memorable you don't want cities in Malaysia to be just cities for people to just do their basic functions and and, and not able to recognize uh, them now uh, let's we go into the issues of um, how we can create uh, identity and uh, according to TL there are visual elements in the city that can be used to that can be used to um sorry <laughs> that can be used to um give identity where there is a sameness in character coherent design and heavy sensibility there are five elements uh, mentioned by tl which is uh buildings uh open uh, site the site where the city is located the buildings the open spaces the trees and the roads but sadly in malaysia uh two of the elements which is the building and the roads are the one that is very noticeable and very memorable in uh, creative identity and uh, for the buildings you know not necessarily through the architecture but more basically through its function um, so that's something a lot need to be done in, in in getting the identity for our cities now uh, the next uh, aspect that I would like to discuss in how people read really is the townscape now uh, for an urban designer the townscape is the product where we would like to show uh, how uh, the, the theories uh, in urban design is being uh, applied and interpreted to create a townscape that is memorable, that's having a sense of place, that is a townscape that is uh, uh, supporting the genius loci or the spirit of place so that uh, a place will have a strong identity being distinct from the rest. What it meant by townscape is the art of relationship. Now, uh, a city is composition you know you you uh it's not just a city the city is not just a place where you you organize the 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 buildings and the streets according to the lots or the zone but you have to compose it like a work of art before you can create uh, a composition that is uh, having a unique um uh, uh, character and this involves you know uh designing uh, the way the city is going to be uh, built of, across a, a, a point of time. And this involves uh, the place, the content, and the vision. How, how, people, how a place is being viewed, and what are the contents that is going to be appreciated, and how the place is being designed in order to display all this. So this art of juxtaposition of each building in relation to the immediate building next to it is very important uh, in order to create a good townscape. What is meant by juxtaposition is how you locate, locate buildings in relation to its context, in relation to its surrounding, and what are the uh, visual uh, effects that you want to create uh, uh, from this um, of juxtapositioning. And I, uh, this is uh, what is missing at the moment because most of the time this, the, the, the city is being designed according to the lot, uh, according to the parcel of the land that has been um, um, divided uh that uh, uh, according to the legal um uh to the uh, legal uh, owners uh, of the land and once the once the lot has been divided and parceled then you 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 can see that this art of juxtaposition position sometimes cannot happen uh between one lot to the other 
and 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 then I think uh, the concept of island planning, which was actually mentioned by uh, uh, architect Lilian T in our previous webinar, is happening now. So what is meant by island planning is that every parts of the city are being designed according to the parcel of the the lot, rather than the city is an uh, ensemble of many physical and non-physical attributes that shape its urban fabric. So uh, this. Our city is like a book, actually, which can be read through the townscape. Uh, the difference by uh, the difference of read, uh, between reading a book that you will you already know, you know, the the conclusion at the end, and a book where you are being enticed to 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 find out more and more. There is a sense of mystery, a sense of uh, you know, who done it? Or I mean, if it's a it's a book about murder and mystery, there's a sense of mystery uh, in the sense that you want to explore the city in order to actually uh, really uh, understand. What uh, the storytelling, which there is not Anga mentioned about storytelling, which is very important. Uh, when you design cities, you have to design a story. You have to actually design the city as if it is a, there is a story to be read when you uh, venture into the city. And you cannot do that without actually having to design the, the townscape in giving that storytelling. And uh, um, so the so when going back to the, the the process of you know the analogy of reading a book uh, compared to reading a, a city that when uh, when a book uh, is being you know you have a book where at the beginning is they only tell you what will be the conclusion you know there's nothing to explore anymore there's no sense of mystery and surprise as compared to a book where you have to read the whole book and at the end of the the conclusion then only you 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 you, you actually um know what what is the whole uh, plot all uh, about so uh, we have to treat our townscape in that way. So we we have to design the townscape so it's element of surprise, element of mystery, element of wanting to entice people to explore the city rather than a city that is so predictable that you can once you go there you see no all. Um, is for the composition of townscape to achieve a sense of unity in design that give the observer a sense of delight and enjoyable experience. So. Um, Cullen is one of the pioneers of the one who actually uh, established the theories on uh, townscape through his book, uh, The Concise Townscape, where he also uses uh, sketches, yeah, Pak Angga, uh, in order to describe the uh, character of the townscape that is actually uh, giving the character to the city. And interestingly enough, Cullen uses the medieval townscape to illustrate this, uh, the, the, the character and also to establish the the, the vocabulary to describe the townscape because like i said the medieval townscape is where is at is, is the townscape that has been designed uh, with the uh, artistic composition as well a lot of elements of surprise in the design of the townscape there are, there are three important uh component a concept that Cullen introduced when he discussed the townscape is about first is about the vision because we use our visual faculties to actually read the city and also to appreciate the city so it's a so we have to really consider the visual attributes that entice the eyes uh, in the design of the townscape and that's why visual impact analysis is very important when you want to decide you know where how the city is going to be designed especially in uh, sites of important uh, uh, or site of uh, significance um, uh, to the city or, or heritage spaces, what will be the visual uh, impact for the new design in relation to its um, uh, context? So the because the visual attributes are the one that that is actually enticing the eye and also affects the the the, the quality of the townscape. And next is about the position, which is the juxtaposition, the way you locate building and the landform and the kinesthetics. The kinesthetics is about how you move about in the city, whether you're going up or going down, it actually, actually has an effect uh, um, in your visual um, uh, experience and also, and also in the way you, you uh, appreciate the townscape. And finally is the content, the fabric that actually make up the city and the detailings. What is lacking in our modern cities is the lack of the emphasis given to the details. You know, we are we are very um we design cities this is like a fast food, you know, everything is being made um oversimplified everything. Although you know sometimes simplicity simplicity is the best, but if you oversimplify everything, then you make the city very bland, monotonous, and so predictable. Next. So um the other theories uh, regarding the uh, uh, townscape is 
is given by Gibbets, you know, where he discussed the raw materials of soundscape. I mean, just like an artist, you know, having raw materials to work with before they come up with a painting or something, or like a sculptor, you know, having a, a material to come up with it. Our treatise is also have its raw materials, and the townscape is actually the um, the product of that uh, composition and how you use the raw materials and in order to uh, come up with a product. So there are these objects which are the raw materials of the townscape because through their forms, shape, texture, colors, and line, you know, they influence the way the townscape is being read and appreciated. And then we have the spaces. Uh, things like the enclosure, the openness, the tactile of floor, the walls uh, that make up the spaces are, are the one that is uh, uh, interesting. So if you don't, if you if you lack uh, urban spaces in uh, in the city, it's like you have no rooms because uh, open spaces are like indoor, uh, like the outdoor rooms. If you imagine the city like a building, then the open spaces are the 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 rooms, and the streets are the corridors. Uh, and then the movement, the kinesthetic qualities and the sense of motion must be appreciated. You, know? you have to imagine that people need to be, uh, in order for people to appreciate uh, in reading the city and in order to associate with certain identity, you, know, uh, you have to appreciate you know, what, what, how uh, the city is going to be read in regard to the sense of uh, motion and kinesthetic qualities. Yeah, I mean, I know the easy way out to design uh, undulating uh, uh, places, you know, you just to cut the hills and to fill up the spaces. The cut and fill is actually destroying this, uh, this kinesthetic qualities of a place. So if you've been to places like uh, San Francisco, you can see, you know, you like, it's like a roller coaster ride, you know, going through the city. But that is the one that gives the, the identity to San Francisco. And what makes San Francisco more memorable is that kinesthetic, kinesthetic uh, qualities and the sense of motion as you travel within that city. And then time, the temporal aspects that affect the lighting qualities, you know, like and the local climate, because you know places which uh, which experience uh, four seasons, you know, are more memorable because every season, every time of the year, you have different quality of the townscape, as compared to us, which have only two seasons. We have the uh, rainy seasons and the sun all the way around you know so that's why we have to work harder in creating a townscape that 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 makes it more memorable because we can we do not have the advantage of the temporal uh, aspects like the seasons you know to break the monotony or the routine uh, life in the city so townscape affects the urban design in two ways first it provides the urban elements that act as objects of sensations and stimulants Secondly, is the experience that people have in observing the townscape and also in engaging with it through their daily activities, thus influencing perception and cognition. So our townscape elements must provide the meanings and association through symbolisms. So people read the city through the symbols that is actually projected by the townscape. And it helps to establish place attachments and foster bonding and sense of pride and belongings. If you have a townscape that people can actually uh, um, uh, relate to their sense of uh, identity and their, uh, their sense of belonging and pride. But because if you have a townscape that people do not have a, an attachment, they will not uh, try to keep the townscape. They will, they will not have any... Um, uh sense of pride in the place and they they can even help to destroy the, the quality of the place so it's very important to create sustainable communities we must design townscape that foster this bonding that foster this sense of pride and belonging so that sustainable communities can be uh created through this and sustainable communities can eventually create sustainable cities so the townscape elements and the art of relationship also affect urban image due to the striking features and their juxtaposition in the city. So hence, they influence the navigation and orientation within the city, making the city imageable. So there is that another uh, direct relationship between townscape and imageability. So how is the soundscape read and appreciated? First, is looking into the setting and the site, which influence the profile of the city, the landform, edges, etc. And then the structures and buildings, through their size, appearance, justice, position, color, texture, and ornamentation, which influence perception. Uh, like I said to you uh, just now, buildings, uh, if you look at, um, like for example, in KL, everybody will recognize this building, you know, even though they probably cannot name it properly, but people recognize it because um, it's been there for a long time. 
uh, it has a very unique architecture. You cannot find that kind of architecture now, uh, or maybe you cannot have as, uh, exactly the same. And and this becomes an important uh, uh, place marker if you see it uh, on the site, uh, uh, because if you want to use it as a landmark, you can't really see it from far because there are many more tall buildings will, will actually outshine the, the, this building uh, uh, in KL. And then there is the vegetation and the natural features such as water bodies. Now, Malaysia is actually a waterfront nation. We are a peninsula. We are surrounded by water. And most of our cities are built by the water. And therefore, this, the, I can say that the water bodies are actually the genus loci of our cities in Malaysia. And we have to protect that this setting. We cannot neglect the waterfront and treat it like a backyard because it's, it's, uh, it's, we owe our the sense of existence our cities to the water. And uh, I'm very glad that um, KL is starting to go through that through its River of Life project. But one of the uh, weaknesses of the River of Life project is that it is only focusing on the linear, linear character of the city, but it, it also it lacks that that um, that uh, contextual integration with the urban fabric. Had had the project uh, had the water riverfront of KL being in, integrated contextually with the fabric of the city, then it would be marvelous. Then we can have a very clear uh, relationship between Kuala Lumpur and the river that is actually the one that creates the genius loci of the uh, Kuala Lumpur. It owed its sense of this existence to these two rivers. Um, Okay, uh, apart from that, the, the spaces, the open spaces, parks, enclosed spaces. I mean, Malaysia, we are not known for uh, squares. We don't have that um, as compared to the Euro European, they are more known for their squares. But we have a unique uh, space which we call the Padang because this is also, we owe it to our colonial um, uh, masters, uh, the British. When they come to Malaysia, they built the Padang as a recreational space. Uh, for 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 them to engage in their cricket playing and so so forth, but actually it shapes the the character and giving uh, a uniqueness to our city because uh, as compared to squares, you know the Padang is turf. Uh, it has a very uh, soft uh, landscape for its um, uh, uh, flooring, which makes it um, uh, good to be used for recreation, but less flexible uh, flexible as compared to uh, the squares. But one uh, criticism that I, I would like to make here, the way we treat our Padang is sometimes we change the surface of the Padang to make it like a square. Instead of Padang, it becomes a dataran. Uh, dataran, then the, the space will be flawed. By changing the flooring, you already change the character of that particular space. So it's, it's just as easy as that. That's why it's very important to understand the theory. Uh, very important to understand the history of the place, you know, why certain spaces are being created, you know, what is the function and how it influences the character of the townscape. So because it is the composition and the appearance of the elements that are read by the observer that influence how they perceive the identity of the place. Like I said to me, we as designer, we can have our own perception of the identity. But if the observer, the no, the, the layman, the person using the street doesn't perceive it the way we do, then we fail as a designer because and it's not that easy for us to be able to read the minds of all the people that use the city. That's why we have to go back to the theory, the design theories and the principles of design uh, in order to, 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 to design because these theories and principles are normally based on uh, research or years of observation of what happens because i remember one of the book uh, uh the art of city planning according to artistic principles um written by camelio city it was way back i was in uh, in the 1400s or 1500s i remember but it's it, the theory has been developed after observing and studying all the successful squares in in, in italy and he he even measured the um uh, the ratio between the height and the width of the of the squares in order to see why the squares are so, so uh, successful and so popular to the people to develop the theory and that's why this i would like the students to realize that it's very important to design based on theory because you can never go wrong but if you design based on your own instinct then you will have a hard time to 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 justify and to convince people that you have got it right so um, the composition of the urban um, uh, uh, elements also must respond to the distinctive qualities of the townscape. Um, uh, 
own. Next, okay, how townscape affects the way people read the city is through uh, the appearance of the city. And because that, I, another thing, there is a, a, a theory that is actually being developed by uh, Amos Rapopo, which is called potential noticeable differences. You know, when we are in the environment, you know, from environmental psychology perspective, your eyes will be trying to find what are the things that is different in the environment to focus in in order to remember the place. Because norm normally, psychologically, when people uh, venture into the city, they want to try to remember the place so that they don't get lost. And how they remember the place is through by trying to find the noticeable differences portrayed by the townscape. And this can be done through the intricateness of details, color, sound, scale, movement, smell, and human activities. And that's why places with all these elements are the one that is easy to remember. And when you are going for very modern and oversimplicity environment, you will make it very difficult for people to recognize the noticeable differences and to uh, to recognize the place. So because that's, that's why modern townscape that consists of blunt facade, uniform environment, introvert activity will fail to catch the attention of the eyes and easily slip their minds. So townscape that has identity are the ones uh, which have the quality of being distinctive, having same in character within a place, yet different from other place, will be more memorable. So, okay, I think we're going to our last few slides, which is the Malaysian townscape. Now, what I did, uh, I, I spent more than 30 years, I mean, about 30 years when I was in UT, I mean, to study about Malaysian uh, city, Malaysian townscapes. Eh? And uh, I get it got, got bored because there's not many cities to, to, to uh, study that are interesting. And most of the time, I focus on the historic townscape, you know, the, the, because these are the ones that is worth talking about when you talk about cities. And the red, but it's not to say that our modern uh, city townscape uh, is not interesting, but in our modern townscape, we I can only see uh, individual buildings that are interesting to talk about. But when they are in a setting, when you have to discuss about the context, you know, this is where we fail because we do not design our city based on a theory of composition of cities. Rather than we are designing cities based just on individual buildings on individual lots. So the typical elements of our nation target are the buildings. And in the historic townscape, one of the most uh, important uh, elements that gives the um, uh, identity is the old shop houses. This is due to its intricate, um, uh, intricate uh, detailings of the, the facade and the way the, 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 way the, the building sits on the site and the growth form, the materials that being used. But I am sad to see that if uh, heritage places, you know, with all historic townscapes are being used as a piece uh, wall for mural, I think that is really sad because it is better not to tamper with heritage uh, buildings or ocean houses. Let the architecture shine through its uh, own architecture rather than using paintings, you know, to, to attract the attention. You can use murals. I'm not saying that you cannot use murals in the townscape, but use murals to disguise the ugly buildings, the one, the, the bland facade, you know, the one that, that where the architecture is nothing to shout about, then you can use the murals, you know, to, to attract the eyes. But when the building has an interesting architecture, it's a, it's a, it has a heritage value, please, you know, leave them alone and let the, the, the just do the maintenance and upkeep, uh, rep uh, repairs and so forth with minimum uh, uh, landscape uh, that is actually not trying to outshine the, the, the architecture building, but they are trying to support it. And then we have the five foot walkways. Our Kaki Lima is a unique feature that gives character to our city. But sadly, if you look at the modern uh, shop houses, there is the, the design of the five foot walkway is not like an enclosed, you know, arcade walkway within the building, but they are just an exposed overhang. So the, the whole character has been changed. And then we have the open spaces, the Padang parks, which I mentioned just now. We have a waterfront, trees, vegetation, and the street furniture. But what is lacking is the art of relationship and composition. We have, it's like we have all the interesting ingredients, but we just don't know how to cook it to make it a, a, a delicious and interesting meal. So this is where we are losing that, that skill. We are losing that art of building cities that celebrate the townscape. And this is what we are trying to champion in uh, Prekabanda. So you can see, you know, like, as it is now, we have interesting places uh, uh, in the cities in Malaysia. But these these places, you know, are are, are not safe. Uh, they they won't be there all the time because 
and they are, they are, they are also being in a position where they are also becoming a threat to to give way for new uh, commercial or, uh, oriented environment this is our problem because uh, most of the development the pressure for development is at the places where there are in, uh, heritage uh, uh, buildings like we see in malacca where you know there are a lot of uh, land reclamation down, done being surround, uh, surrounding the World Heritage Site so much so that we lost the character of a uh, waterfront city and the World Heritage Site is now detached from the seafront which is its original setting. So, so much tempering in, in the need to uh, make places for commercial development which is sometimes you know, a result of speculative, speculative development. That is also, you can see some of the buildings being built and there's no not even some people renting this, uh, the place that they're all just vacant. Um, a set trend is like I said to say, you know, doing murals on uh, historical buildings or, or even building old buildings with heritage values, you know. When you do the murals, uh, you paint on them, you know, it's like you wanted to disguise them. That is actually the psychological effect. And why do you want to disguise the heritage buildings? They are the one with the, the, the interesting architecture, the uniqueness, uh, because it's, you, can't, you cannot produce any more of these kind of things uh, here with our, with our current technology and our, our context. Um, okay. So if you see um, another aspect of our townscape in Malaysia is our marketplaces, you know. Um, being a waterfront, uh, like I said, you know, we being a city of uh, waterfront uh, cities, you know, apart from the waterfront, marketplace and the jetties is also an important component that, that makes up the urban fabric and influencing the urban morphology of uh, our cities. And the uniqueness of the way we apply our trades in the marketplace is, uh, is something that display the culture uh, of the people. If you want to know the local culture and character people go to the marketplace because this is this the marketplace is not just a place where you sell goods it's also a place where it display how people live you know what kind of food they they, they eat how they apply in their trades for example in pasar city khadija this is one of the most photographed places in asia i'm not saying asia or southeast asia why people like to take photographs of this uh, marketplace you know it's just uh, like they, they, this, the, the thing about the architecture is just a, a building where it has a, a central space, you know, with triple, triple volume or double uh, volume. And you can actually observe the activities of the marketplace from the above and the way they engage in the activities. You know, they just sit on a very um, um, low uh, platform and most of the traders are women and they just put all their their local products uh, around the place where they where they sit and the way they engage in the street is the one that gives the character and makes them the, the market based uh, giving soul to the city and uh if you look at the typing old market this is one of the the, the design of the old marketplace where uh, it's very air, uh, airy uh it has a unique um roof form uh then uh you it's only the way that they, they apply the traits now, you know, is making it a, a, a hygiene issue. And due to this, uh, with this COVID uh, issue of like uh, needing ventilation, then there's need to um, um, need to reflect back on how to design the, the marketplace so that it's, uh, it's will be a healthier place uh, in the future. And then apart from that, so I said the data ram it used to be a padang. It's, 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 Actually, uh, when you have a city that is built in a very dense manner, then it's so important to have spaces like this because it provides a breathing space. It's like a green lungs, you know, when, when you want to breathe, you need a lung. So the, the padang is a green lungs to the city. And we should design our city with a clear hierarchy of all these urban spaces, you know, not just to provide urban spaces as an impromptu decision or just off the cuff decision but they have to be planned and designed as such to what are the function of these spaces you know how are they going to support all the buildings that that is surrounding it and we also have another unique uh, aspect of the city which is the palaces we have several royal towns in Malaysia and the royal uh, the buildings associated with the royal uh, family are the one giving quite a clear identity to the royal towns but sadly you know there is lack of integration between how the royal establishment uh, establishment within the city you know is being integrated with the surrounding uh, urban fabric and this is also another thing that needs to be um uh, clearly thought of 
So soundscape without the uh, art of composition will be just an ensemble of buildings. So without this art of composing, you can see that it's just going to be uh, just uh, uh, buildings, which can be anywhere and everywhere. Apart if you, that's why we need to have the building to be placed. You, you need to have an advertisement board to tell where you are. You cannot just recognize the building to the places to the buildings. So a space in the city uh, gives a passport for people who travel in the city and opportunity to focus on the visual qualities of the walls surrounding the space and the tactile and the food that will influence the kinesthetic qualities of the city. Uh, now, our modern cities, I think uh, Jakarta is also facing the same problem. <laughs> we are now we are having our city dominated by tall buildings, which is out of necessity, um, probably because it is uh, the, our current trend, obviously, is actually dictated by the, the needs to provide for the commercial uh, needs and economy of the uh, uh, country. But one thing we have to remember is that it's okay to design uh, tall buildings, but we must not forget the human scale and the sense of density. When I talk about human scale, it's at the ground level. You can have high-rise buildings, but you have to take care of the ground ground level so that it has a human scale. So that because people actually read the cities at the ground level, at the street level, people don't read the city by just uh, looking at the way up or how tall the building. So it's important to make, to design um, uh, the density at ground ground level so that. No matter how tall the buildings are at the ground level, you will still feel uh, you, the buildings relate to those on the street. And it is so important to have a sense of unity when we have so many tall buildings trying to outshine the other, trying to become the landmarks. When there are so many buildings trying to have to become the landmark, then they will, you will end up not having any landmarks. So there, there should be um, a master plan being produced to decide you know, which area should be the one that has the landmark, which, where, where the tall buildings should be, uh, what is the function of all the tall buildings, and how the tall buildings can fit in within the, the fabric when you have uh, existing low-rise buildings. So uh, what we have now is uh, a townscape that is dominated by traffic and roads. We are very car-centric in the way we build our city. Uh, we are we focus more in, in, in making uh, how the cars can move easily, but not how the human being, the pedestrians can move easily. Because remember, once you get out from the car, you are a pedestrian. No matter how smooth you make the, 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 the townscape for the cars, once you leave your car, you are a pedestrian. You need to walk. You cannot be in the car forever. Unless you design a city where the car can go inside the building and you can just do your things without getting out from the car. But that is quite impossible. That's why people are attracted to go to shopping malls because they can drive and they have a, the convenience of parking their car and then just enter the shopping mall. But if you design cities so much uh, for the shopping malls, you will destroy the street life of the, the, uh, of the city centre because people will no longer want to go to the streets and the streets will be uh, very unsafe places and neglected. So we have now trapped in a townscape we, where we celebrate the advertisement billboards and signages instead of the architecture, especially for the heritage buildings. You know, there should be a policy how where to locate the sign the sign box. You know, you cannot leave up to the owners to put the billboards wherever they like it. You see, if you if you, in UK, you you there is only certain places where the billboards or the advertisement box can be done because they do not want to disturb the facade of the buildings. So um, this is uh, the things that we still have to uh, go about. So um, like I said just now, waterfront, you know, it's, it, it's easy to create identity of place if we respond to the waterfront and use it as part of the design of the city. And having uh, towers, you know, viewing tower and so forth will help to create some sense of unity in, uh, in terms, but uh, uh, provided you um, uh, control the, the surrounding uh, development, not to actually uh, over, uh, overshadow your, your intended landmark. So remember, when the townscape is predictable and lacking in character, uh, to help people to remember the place, then the eyes will focus on the obtrusive elements, such as the traffic or advertisement boards. And our cities are, la are littered with street furniture that is uh, meant for the traffic. And then the city is now being read for its utilitarian function.
because of the lack of aesthetic qualities that entrap the eye. So we will remember cities where the parking are, where are uh, the no entry signage is, you know, where are the bollards, where are the drains. Now we will, we will, the the architecture, of the building will slip our mind because our of our obsession to read the city, uh, uh, due to the street furnitures, and. Again, like I said, it's now the presence of water bodies always make the city memorable if integrated with the city's fabric. And it's, it's, it is the only, it's always the best to start with the waterfronts in order to say, for example, we need to uh, redesign or need to uh, realign back our townscape. Now, it's always safe to start with the waterfront because that is the, one, the easy way to do it. So I'm, I'm coming to my last uh, slide for as a take home note. Uh, the city is being read like a book. Uh, without we, us realizing it. And the quality of townscape will affect the perception and how the city is being read. And this then influence the attitude and the evaluation of the city, which later affects their behavior. So whether we like the city or not, how we behave the city is actually influenced by the way we perceive it. So the lack of sensory qualities, aesthetic qualities, and losing the art of building cities will make the city very mundane, with people focusing only on functional aspects when they read the city. And remember, our townscape is full of symbolism and meanings it has much, therefore it must be respected and addressed in the design of the components that make up the fabric of the city i would like to thank the urban design media lab of Breaker banda for helping me with this slide and i am so sorry for the hiccups the technical glitches uh this morning which really upset uh, the the synchronization between my slides and the one with pa anga but i hope everybody uh try uh, uh actually learn something from uh, today's uh, thank you okay thank you dr sana for the presentation uh i really like to see that uh, you share with uh, the photos in kuantan and several cities in malaysia how bad and poor the urban design elements in our city but uh we have uh i hope that everyone will stay with us until the end of the webinars because we have the uh, photo sessions after this but before that, uh, we have a questions from Marisa to Paanga about how important is uh, the third place concept for urban living. I think uh, Paanga already had the the answers. Uh, you want to share with us uh, your feedback, Paanga? Yes, Miss Akila. If I may, I just share a couple of the slides just to illustrate the answer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sure, no uh, problem. Please allow me to, yes, yeah, very quickly. So uh, this is just a, a, a part of my other studies about the third place. Basically, um, the third place has become very important, especially in the very big city with the very uh, a dense population and a very busy activities. Because uh, third place usually become the transitional. Uh, space between the first place and uh, which is home and the second place. So I think from what I see, this is uh, purely on my observation. Yeah. Uh, so from what I see, usually moving from the first place to the second place, I mean, going from home to work or uh, the other uh, 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 side, usually we, we need a transition. So when we do activity in one of the place, we can be very focused and we are not disturbed by the effect from the previous place. Let's say from the working place, from office, we going home. Usually coming from office, we, we, you know, we have a big headache and we get very pushing. Lah. Dengan all of the problem with all of the issues, you know, the boss is getting angry or the client is getting mad, blah, blah, blah. And then we need a place just to, uh, as a transition to, you know, sort of like, um, 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 uh, wash down all of the stress before we get home. Because when we get home, usually we met the family, we met the we met the kids, we met the wife or the husband, and etc. And and I mean, um, the situation is very different. So I think the third place, one of the important is to keep the people to be healthy uh, uh, mentally. I mean, it it can become a place that uh, all of the uh, stress and all of the burden from the previous place can be sort of like washed down. So I think it's very important. That's why in uh, in the big city uh, like Jakarta, uh, which is a developing city right now, the the third place can be a 
like um, Dr. Suhana mentioned, yeah, I mean, in, in the four season countries, maybe it's a bit easier to find an open space or the, uh, you know, a park or garden that actually a very comfortable to, to stay in. But I think in the tropical countries like Indonesia and Malaysia, it's a bit tricky. But then actually what uh, I found is very interesting. If I may show you another slide, actually, in Jakarta now, uh, now in Jakarta, there is a tendency to use uh, an old colonial buildings as a third place because it's connected very easily to the pedestrian path and to the uh, circulation networks. And it has a certain type of uh, comfort level. I mean, colonial buildings usually, if it's uh, if if it was an office, it will be very huge, very uh, big, and then uh, the air circulation is very, very nice. So this is one of the example in Jakarta where these buildings, the colonial buildings, uh, the post office uh, used to be a post office, now become one of the third place in Jakarta because it has a very nice uh, quality of the space like this. This is just illustration how even the buildings uh, with a very comfort level, very convenient level of uh, thermal can be a very nice third place. So I think that's my uh, quick and brief um, response to the question. Thank you, Ms. Akila. Uh, thank you, Pa Angga. I hope that Pa Angga answered the questions by uh, Marisa. Uh, uh, but Pa Angga, I think uh, in Malaysia, our third place is shopping mall because <laughs> Malaysian people love to go to shopping mall instead of park and or a square. But uh, we can see the difference or the recreational changes behavior. Uh, after the uh, pandemic or during the pandemic that people more appreciate the open space. I think because of we understand or we aware about the infections of the COVID that we need uh, the better ventilation. So I think people prefer to go outdoor instead of the shopping mall. But I think it's very um, great sessions. Uh, also, we have a, a one comment from No Pisa about the Twin City. Let our people to live, to enjoy our city, not to focus as to differentiate and unique city. There is nothing wrong with the twin city, for example. And I think everyone, everything is nothing. Uh, there is no other questions. Uh, from Hakim Daniel, agree with Dr. Suhana, the excessive installations of the signboards overshadow the facet of commercial buildings, not only in old towns, but also in a new township such as Eco World. The LA needs to control this. Yeah, right. And then from Fatin Shamimi, great talk, love it. I think uh, I think uh, we already at the end of the webinar session. Uh, maybe last word from Dr. Suana. Oh, <laughs> okay. I just like to respond just now about this. Uh, our craze with the shopping malls. You know, mm -hmm. um, I remember one of the, when I was um, uh, when I was with the UN Habitat um, expert group uh, member to review the city prosperity index one of our um, panel panel comes from australia Chris, Chris, uh, Uut in australia. he said to me why are you uh, in why are you malaysians obsessed with uh, building shopping malls in the cities i said uh because it's very speculative because we are we are we we do not uh, control the the kind of uh, development uh, we allow the the market you know to operate you know so sometimes you know shopping complexes are built not because people like to go to shopping malls not because there is a need for the shopping malls mm. but because it's a speculative uh, act whereby the developer will trying to um to make uh, lots of profit from uh, buildings and you can see that some shopping malls were built and never opened nobody there's no takers and this is really a waste very unsustainable when you talk about that's why i said sometimes i know i i'm very vocal uh with, uh, very very honest with my opinion you know sometimes i i i see uh, our obsession with sustainable cities is very uh, it's just like a, a slogan you know we just, we just talk about sustainable cities as because it's fashionable to do so when we built so many shopping malls and the shopping malls are there's no takers nobody renting the shopping malls some shopping malls they just open at the ground level you know because uh, not enough to that this is very unsustainable because we are wasting we're wasting the the resources you know to build buildings that are not needed but we 
let the political will or or or, or, or our willingness to build uh, public spaces, public places for people to enjoy because they they are not profitable, but they are important to create healthy city, to create the good mental health, especially with the pandemic, you know, people are crazy, you know, being locked down in their own houses, you know, without, uh, without uh, uh, the ability to, to, to go, uh, uh, to inhale fresh air and to engage with, uh, with um, uh, leisure activities uh, to keep their, their mind sane. And we cannot do that because we have not designed our cities, you know, to have uh, urban spaces enough urban spaces for people to use a good example is when uh during the lockdown when they start to open the parks you know the available parks in in kl everybody rushed to the parks you know it was so crowded they have to close the parks again yes, yes. so it, you can see yes. you know I, I remember when i did my phd you know my my, my supervisor is professor uh, jc martin you know he he wrote lots of urban design books and okay he was say asking me swana why why are people attracted to the shopping malls in Malaysia? And it becomes a major note in Malaysia. I said because there's not enough recreational places to go to. Because if you compare, you know, if you have the option of you can have uh, uh, places for recreation uh, near near your neighborhood places, you don't have to go to shopping malls to entertain yourself because it's very dangerous to go to shopping malls because you will spend unnecessarily through compulsive buying. This is also not sustainable. And people will... And Malaysia has a very high rate of debts, you know, people using credit cards and not able to pay because the the power of advertisement, the the when you go to the shopping malls, you are easily enticed to buy things that you don't need. And this is not very healthy, you know, uh, even economically. So I don't know. I think there's a lot of challenges to rebuild our cities, you know, to make them sustainable in the true sense of the word and for us to make sure our cities reclaim back its identity because that is the motto of Preka Bandar, reclaiming back the character of nation cities. Okay, I'll start with that. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Sana. I totally agree with your statement. Uh, last word from Pa Angga. Um, yeah, I think, uh, I mean, this this discussion is uh, going very interesting. Yeah, I mean, we can talk about this for more than maybe three or four yeah. days. Yeah. I maybe think, we, uh, we should Dr. have another session. Uh, yeah, maybe yes, later. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, I think uh, I'm. I'm just trying to to respond to the uh, phenomena that uh, actually Jakarta also have it. I mean, the shopping mall still the become the main destination is also because in Jakarta, to be honest, I mean the weather uh, condition is is very. Uh, I mean, it's quite rough. It means I mean it's very hot outside and it's very. Uh, uh, I mean, it's not convenient for people to stay uh, quite long time outside, but then they just try to find a very convenient space, uh, aircon uh, spaces that can sort of like make them feel relaxed. So that's why still shopping malls still also one of the the biggest destination in Jakarta. And I think um, uh, one of the phenomena that I just show uh, before, I mean, uh, that actually just gets started for the last two years where the some of the state-owned company that own uh old, old heritage building they are just starting to utilize it because yeah just like dr suhana said because it's yet abandoned and it um it didn't um uh, attract revenue so basically it's just abandoned abandoned building and then they are trying to make a use of it and then some of the creative uh, people like uh, the, the a group of architects and branding people and also retail people they are they come with a certain concept that actually uh, make the buildings looks more active and become a convenient place to stay one of the elements that make the colonial buildings in jakarta quite convenient because of the scale and also usually it um, located, I mean, it's it get built in a big complex with uh, several smaller buildings. So it creates like a, a mini model of a city. So it has a corridor, it has a, a terrace and in a situation, I mean, in a tropical situation, the building layout like that uh, tend to uh, make the microclimate is more comfortable. So that's why the couple of the old buildings now starting to get reactivated and it become a new destination of Jakarta people aside of shopping malls. I think, uh, I, I hope that 
phenomena uh, i mean can can be dispersed broadly and then can also happening in a lot of city in indonesia uh, i also try to help the the guys who operate one of the uh, uh, colonial building to also talk about another uh, old building in another city in indonesia and i, I hope it can be a a serious uh, options a set of shopping malls so i think that's for another uh, type of discussion Ms. Ah, yeah. Dr. <laughs> uh, Suhana I think uh, my maybe my closing remark is uh, I think what what we learn today from Dr. Suhana is about the reading of the city it also can help uh, planners designers architects and also contribute to the shape of the city I think that's my my closing remarks thank you Ms. Akila yeah, welcome Pak Angga. Uh, thank you so much Dr. Suhana and Pak Angga for the uh, closing remarks. Uh, but before we end the webinar, I would like everyone to turn on the camera because we have the photo session. So the uh, uh, public sector to involve, uh, I mean to uh, influence the